All right, so I just want to say a few quick announcements before we get started. Uh, but first of all, welcome. Welcome so much. I'm so glad we're all here together today. Uh, my name is Anna Ballou, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator here at the Endangered Languages Project. Uh, I am speaking to y'all as a grateful visitor on the territories of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kaflamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala, and uh, several other tribes and peoples who continue to inhabit and care for this beautiful place now called Portland, Oregon in the United States. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, first, I wanna give big, big thanks to the interpreters and volunteers who will be helping the events run smoothly today. Uh, I want to thank Jose Villanueva, Elena Efimova, and Lilian Williams, who will be interpreting into Spanish and French today. Uh, and you can listen to the interpretations if you are on a computer. Go to the bottom of your screen and click the globe icon that says interpretation and select the language that you want to listen to. Uh, and after Dr. Williams' talk, we encourage you to ask questions or share about your own experiences. And you can do that by clicking the Q&A icon down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we'd also like to remind you that this chat or this event is being recorded. So if you ask any questions or type in the chat, your name will appear in the recording. Just keep that in mind. Uh, but I just want to say I'm so happy to be here uh, on behalf of myself and Amanda Holmes, the Language Revitalization Associate at ELP. We are so happy to be in this virtual space with all of you today. We really never expected this event to fill up. Uh, and we are amazed and humbled that more than 450 people wanted to gather to celebrate the work that's happening to reclaim, renew, and strengthen languages around the world here at the beginning of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. Uh, and we want to say a little bit about our goals with this event. Uh, this started as a little idea Amanda and I had to welcome the International Decade with sort of an informal event a gathering of friends and colleagues from around the world, sharing stories and ideas and insights from our work in language revitalization. Uh, and we wanna say a big thanks to a couple of those colleagues and partners. Uh, the First People's Cultural Council and the First People's Cultural Foundation have provided the support we needed to carry out this entire event, as well as most of ELP's work. They are doing really amazing things in the revitalization of British Columbia's First Nations languages, cultures, and arts. And we thank them so much for their support. And we also wanna thank our partners at the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage who are doing amazing work with their language vitality initiative. Uh, and we, during this pandemic, all of us are really missing the chance to gather together and connect and chat and just enjoy each other's company. So we hope that this festival will offer a little bit of that feeling of community and camaraderie. Uh, these, these are challenging times and the work of language revitalization is always challenging, but it's also profoundly nourishing. And while language revitalization can sometimes feel lonely or isolating, there is an entire world of solidarity and mutual support out there. Uh, people on every continent around the world are fighting for their languages with creativity and dedication and a profound love for their people. And they're finding success all over the world. People are finding success revitalizing their languages. You are not alone wherever you are. You are not alone in this crucial work. And we hope that this festival is a place for you to connect with old friends, make new ones, and just be reminded that there are thousands of folks out there cheering for you. So we hope this festival offers a space for all of you to relax and learn from each other, find inspiration and encouragement, share your knowledge and ideas, and return to your communities and language work with renewed enthusiasm and strength. Uh, and that's enough from me. So without further ado, we are truly and deeply honored to hand the floor to Chiska Rorick, who will be introducing our opening keynote, keynote speaker, Dr. Lorna Williams. Chu Anna. Na ata hech chani. Chu chao, chu chao. Si yaxis chutska. Umma tu kaktlish se hech 
Wa'nasta, Wa'nasta, Ahku Chamita, Tlutzma e Dr. Lorna Williams, Chair of the First Peoples Cultural Foundation. Chamita Tlutzma e Lorna, Wa'nasta, Tlaya ho art mahsanish si wa Ahku Hishum yil e Chu Na ata huitas nish Wa'nasta, Aha unax. Two. <laughs> Uchsanich. Eljauna ti wa um ti wa wan ja Victoria. It's um it's a real pleasure and a real um honor for me to have been invited to to spend some time with you, to meet with you. First, I want to say thank you to the organizers for helping us to join together in these times. I want to thank Chutska for her greeting and for her welcoming words and for the opportunity for me to be able to work with a woman who is as brilliant as she is. I am so grateful. I have been working, I said in my greeting that, I, that my people are from from Lilwet, Lilwet Ul. I'm um and that's where that's where I come from. And I live here now on the lands of the Lakwanan speaking people, the Songhees, the Esquimalt, and the Huxanich people. And um, and I'm so grateful to them for for letting me be a part of their land here and to learn with them. And, um, but I, I, uh, this talk is, um, I think is, um, is a rallying for our, for all of our languages around the world. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about where we've, where we've come from that I am aware of and where we are today and what we need to be able to do as we begin this decade of, in, of indigenous languages. And then where I think that we need to focus our attention during that time. And, um, and then I'm hoping that you will ask me some questions. So I'm going to begin uh, to let you know, and this is um, all in story form. So, um, and it's a story about uh, what I've learned and what I've um, come to know because of my work with indigenous languages. I began with languages as a child, uh, knowing that, um, that I was uh, unilingual in my, my language, Uchwalmich. And I started school and my brothers, um were were who went to school before me were taking me to school and as we were running to this to the school which was you know about a, a mile and a half away from our house and um they were teaching me english words and um and that i believe began my work with languages because as a as a six-year-old, I began. I I was learning that there were there were other sounds and other words other than our words, and that that there were two languages, and that was for me um, a revelation. And so they taught me the words yes. They but what they were teaching me was they said. If the, if the teacher's eyes go like this, then you say, yes, they said. But if her eyes go like this, then you say, no. 
And then they said, but if you, if you can't tell, then you say maybe. <laughs> and so those were my first three words as we were running to the schoolhouse. And after that, in, so during that time that I was in grade one, I, um, I loved learning and, um, and we had a really good teacher and she was, um, you know, there were four grades in our class and um, everybody was trying to learn this, this, uh, this language called English. And then in grade two, I was sent to residential school and during my years in residential school, it wasn't very long, three years, I um, lost my capacity to speak any language. And it was there that I learned that there were other languages. Um, and, um, and so that began my language work. And I, um, when I left residential school, I ended up in, the ho in a hospital for four months. And where the English was the only language at that time there in being spoken. And, um, and so I learned English. And, you know, and as a, a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, I became, I became an interpreter. I didn't know that's what I was doing. But the old people would come and get me if they needed English. And they'd take me with them to you know, the store or to the lawyer or to the Indian agent or to the doctor if, uh, and I would translate for them. And, um, and then I come from a community that was that where the lang our language was still very strong even though we were close to a large urban area, but we were fairly closed because, because of geography. And, um, and so our lang we were able to retain our language. We retained our cultural ways. We retained our relationship with our land, even though it had diminished and there were many parts of our lands that we could no longer travel on, live on, be on, and have a relationship with. But the community was, was strong. And, um, and also though, I did see when the shifts began to happen, the, the shifts in the cultural ways, the shifts in the ways in which we related to the, to the earth, the shifts in the way that we related to one another, because there were so many people who were removed from our communities for many different reasons, for education, as I said, to residential schools, for education to be able to attend high school, for medical reasons. There were many people in our communities who were removed because of tuberculosis, because of the cold, because of influenza, because of many other diseases that were that were gripping our communities. And so our, our and I didn't know this, but it was common for indigenous peoples around the world um, in the places, especially where there were where they lived in the midst of colon, the colonizers, that for those people, for us, we lived separate lives. We couldn't go to just any school. We couldn't go to a hospital, for example. We had to have special hospitals for us, and so people then were confined. Our people were confined to these special hospitals. People were being incarcerated, removed for any, any, anything and put into jail. And, um, and that was um, a way of removing our people. And so there were many, many ways in which our people were be being removed from our communities. And so when you can imagine what it must feel like when you no longer have children in a household, when you no longer have children running in the community, 
And when you realize the silence, that there is no, that there are no more stories, that the old people who tell the stories to the children at, at bedtime are silent. It's, it does something to a language and it does something to the minds of people. And so that was my experience. But my community and like many in, I found many of the world over indigenous peoples, there are people who don't, who don't give in. There are people who continue and to find ways to thrive no matter what. And there were people in my community who were like this. And they noticed in my community that life was changing. As I said, our relationships on the land, with each other, with our language, with our traditions were changing. And, and a, a good example of that was an experience I had when I was about 12 years old. And my my mom was very active in the community and she and there were people you know from the community in our house and one of the things they were doing was they were creating the names and a roster of songs that they would perform that they were perform when they were invited out to sing our songs because our songs you know either are um they, they belong to people, they have purpose, they have, there's a reason for them to be used. And, um, and so they had to be very careful about which songs they would select and choose. And they were, I remember how they would be laughing and having such a good time coming up with names for our songs. And that was a really good lesson for me about you know, the challenges that we had, that we faced in being able to present ourselves to a different cultural world. And, um, and, and that was a good lesson with the songs. And so there were many times, many ways in which our people had to do this. And, one of the things that was happening were pe was that people, young people, children were coming back home. And many of them were coming home to very disrupted families and because of all what had happened to us. And so it was decided that, um, that school was one of the reasons for this, for this disruption and for the the devaluing of our languages and our knowledge systems. And so we did, so Mount Curry, the Litwat decided, and it was really at the instigation of a group of 12 year olds to take over our school and to and finally, and to be able to determine what would be learned. And so this is what I, I um, joined and um, I was hired to work in the school. Um, and one of the things that the early ac actions of the community was to do a survey, to survey what people wanted from the school. And overwhelmingly, not 100%, but nearly 100%, of the people said they wanted the school to focus on retaining our language, Litwat. And they wanted their children to speak Ukwalmiuch. This was going to be a challenge for us, but this is something that we were going to take up. How to do this was, was a real, was a challenge for us, was it was a struggle. 
And, um, but we were going to take it on. They also said they want their children to retain and to, and to find a good relationship with the land. And this was really important. They wanted their children to know our history, our way of life. They wanted their children though, to learn about the other cultures and to, to know that they lived now in two worlds. And so this was what our school was based on. And, um, and we began, we began the work of teaching our language. Our language, like most indigenous languages around the world, is, an, is, is based on an oral tradition. We speak the language. We share the language through speech, through talking, through sharing. It isn't a written language. And so, but we live now in a literate world. And so one of our first challenges was the question, are we going to, are we going to join the, the world of literacy? And what does that mean? And how do we go about it? And, and this, is a, this is something that, um, that, we, uh, that, that people around the world have to face and have to decide and have to figure out how to, how to, um, how to deal with this. And one of the things that I learned uh, in those early years of, um, of learning how to write my language, um, how to read my language, how to teach both an oral tradition and a written tradition, that there are two very different traditions and one of the biggest lessons for me was in a class where we had people who didn't, who no longer spoke our language, people who didn't speak our language, people who understood our language but didn't, uh, but didn't feel comfortable anymore speaking it, and people who were fluent in the language. And I watched these three groups, and I'm sure that there were more, but generally and how they approached learning. And that was a big lesson for me because the way that, that the, these three groups approached learning and used or couldn't use literacy was, was, a real, um, was very different. And I realized that the way we teach, how we teach, how we approach learning has to has to take into account these different these different experiences in um, with with the language. We had to create. We started to create um, document. We began documenting the language to to start working on the curriculum. And one of the challenges that we faced was that. Our language is made up of dialect of, of dialects. Different communities of our language territory use a different dialect. The south, southern part of our territory, the southeast uses a different um, dialect. The north uh, uses a very different of our territory uses a different dialect, and. And when we were working on our documentation and on our curriculum, we realized that we had to, we had to respect all the dialects. And so luckily we come, from, my community is large and there are many people who have married into our community from each of those dialects. And so we invited them to to be a part of our language, our dictionary committee. And so that we could in a dictionary figure out how to respect all the dialects of our language. And this is something, you know, this was in the seventies with, we were working on this in the 1970s. And so 
literacy, documentation, um, organizing information in a dictionary, writing curriculum was a big challenge because all of the curriculum templates and the way that people teach is based on a very Western point of view. It's a, it's a very Western use of language. And so one of our challenges then was to be able to, to look at these templates and, and to try to figure out how would it be as a lead what? How would you organize information as, as a lead what? How would you organize um, teaching and learning when the teaching and learning ideas that are promoted in teacher education, in curriculum, in education are all based on a colonial worldview. And that was, that's been a challenge. I'll talk a little bit more about this because it continues to be a challenge. But this is something that we had to grapple with. And, um, and when I look at the early materials that I developed and that our team developed, I can see that that's what we were grappling with. And um, although they continue to be useful, I realize that they're, very, they're based on a very colonial mindset. And then, you know, as we worked, we began to, uh, one of the things that I just really think is, um, is so powerful about our people, and that is that we know how to engage. We work together. We're always seeking for, for ideas and for help, and we, and we mold it and break it down and come up with a new way. And so that's what I could see people were doing. We were all doing this, trying to search and help each other because we knew that we couldn't find what we needed at universities. We couldn't find what we needed in textbooks. And so we had to help each other. And different peoples in the world did different things and, um, and shared, willingly shared what they, what they learned. What the Maori did with the, with the language nests, what the Sami did with bringing, keeping their languages on the land and using the land to teach their languages. There were people from around the world who were trying different things. And we would take these ideas home and try them out. One of the things that happened here in British Columbia, um, it would have been in um, the late 80s, early 90s, was an organization came into creation called First Peoples Cultural Council. And their task was to provincially support the revitalization of languages, cultures, arts, and heritage. And I, I raise this because, I'm, I, I, because I think that that is so key to our way of revitalizing, revitalization. It can't just be language. It has to be language along with our world. And, um, the other thing that um, that, for, that First Peoples did was um, was to support communities themselves in the direction that the communities wanted to take, and this is key: that the community has to be in charge and has to take the lead, and that organizations must support these language communities, because every language community is in a different place, is in a different, in a, in, at a different stage in their development, or they might want to focus on something that's very unique to, to their world. And it's important that um, organizations learn 
and support. And, um, but at the same time, they need to be able to, to lift themselves up high and to look like an e to look through an eagle's eyes, to be able to see a greater picture. And so we need, because we need both, we need the, the close eyes, the close to the ground, and, um, and, but we need the big eagle eyes to be able to see the greater picture. And that's what I think organizations need to do and um, to be able to support languages. And so what First Peoples has done is they've gone the world over and learned. They've taken, they've been courageous enough to open doors to areas that we need to go. They've supported then not just the communities, but they've supported language revitalization at a, at, a, at, a, at a provincial level. And all the multiple 203 communities in the, com, in the province, they've supported them and uh, recognized that each is in a different place and they each need to start where they need to and want to start. For example, one of the things that um, that has just been so beautiful is that they worked on documentation, and one of the and on um, being able to organize and to distribute and to archive docu the, the language documents. And one of our languages, a very powerful language in the, in the south uh, east of our province, Tunaha, for many, for many, many years, it was said that this language was gone, was extinct. But that language continued to live. And in the documentation at First Peoples, that language very early on became the best documented language of all of our languages. That's how hard the people worked and that and the de their dedication. And, um, and so we need to be able to share the good things. We need to be able to share our successes. We need to be able to share our challenges the challenges that we face. We need to be able to share where we might have um, taken the wrong path and how we found another path. But we need to be able to share these with one another. And so an organization like ELP and different organizations like this can, <clears throat> can serve this. In this decade of indigenous languages, let us do a number of things. One is continue. We need to continue and to make sure that the world appreciates, values every indigenous language, every. Our languages are the voices of each of our lands, the lands on which they were born. They tell those stories. They keep, the, the, they keep our connection to our ancestors through our languages and the ancestors whose spirits continue to be on the land. They keep our connection to the ecology to everything and everyone that grows on that land. And we need to be able to, to know that our languages serve as their memory. And we need to respect and honor that and to value it. Probably in this day, we need more than ever the knowledge of this that we, can, that we have with our languages in order to be able to recover, to try to recover what has been hurt and damaged by humans. 
we need to be able to not just heal the to help and to do our part with the earth we need to be able to help each other and in indigenous communities the world over one of the one of the beautiful 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 teachings is the caring, the generosity that, that exists within our cultures. And you can see it in our languages. We can see it in the way that we use language. And so one of the challenges that I, I'm encouraging you to face is that let us in this decade bring into the world in a very powerful, strong and, and determined and dedicated way. We need to be able to bring our, our knowledge that is present in our languages into the world so that it can be known and respected and cherished because our way of knowing is extremely important to humanity and to the earth. That's our challenge is to be able to name that, to not translate only our language, but to bring, but even to teach the colonial languages, that there is another way. And, and there is a beautiful way that we can learn from the indigenous languages and the, the indigenous peoples who are connected to, the, to this beautiful home that we all call the earth. Have a wonderful time in the, at this festival. Thank you again to the organizers, to Anna for dreaming and Amanda for dreaming this up and for making it happen. Thank you so much, Lorna. Uh, Chutska will be moderating questions from the audience, but again, thank you. Thank you, Lorna. Uh, this was a wonderful way to begin the festival and we're all so honored and grateful to have gotten to hear you speak today. Uh, Chutska, I'll turn it over to you. True. So I um, am looking in the Q&A box and we have zero questions. So now is your time. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cook stems for your words, Dr. Lorna. This is Angelina Rose. I would like to know what you think makes a good language teacher. Well, first of all, a good language teacher is somebody who I think loves language and, um, and brings joy to the teaching of, to, to learning, a joy to learning. And um, and somebody who is very supportive to um, supportive to to um, to learners and um, so somebody who likes to learn themselves. True. Thank you. Um, this question comes from Sarah Jane Siri. How can someone who is not a member of the respective indigenous community assist in making meaningful change? By being, um, by being a really supportive ally and, um, and by, um, by getting, you know, by participate, by being a full participant. Um, so for example, um, 
when we started our school in Mount Curry, and there were people from who weren't, there were people who were not from our community, who were um, present in our community, and they brought with them their own uh, expertise and their knowledge. And um, they didn't impose it, but they contributed it and it became part of the part of the conversation. And uh, so they were willing to listen, but they were willing to to give, and they were and and one of you know one of um, in our in our school we had for example um, nuns who were teaching before we took over the school, and they continued after we took over the school, and so they were from most of them were from Quebec. So they spoke another language other than English. And one of the things that was so valuable, I think, to our community was they signed up for our language classes. So they learned, they began to learn our language along with everybody. And, um, and uh, so just their willingness to engage and to you know, to be a full participant um, made such a huge difference. So engaging, being a participant and not, not being the one to impose, uh, but, you know, to be a part of. So that's what people have to learn. Thanks. True. This is from Sophia Hidvegi. Thank you, Lorna. Wonderful and powerful message. Could you please elaborate on your practice about involving all the dialects in education and respecting the identities of different speech communities? Mm -hmm. I, um, this was, a, as I said, was a real challenge for us at the beginning. And until we remembered what it was like um, at our events. And so, for example, um, when people came from our other dialects and in the wintertime, for example, the people from the South East, because of their, um, because of the conditions of the, of travel, many of the, the, the people would move into our community for, you know, the, Two or three months in the in the harshest part of the winter and so they would bring their dialect and there were many people who come, came from the northern dialect and um, and it was they it was no problem for people to to cross dialect you know to speak each other's dialect and um, and there was always a respect for each other's dialects and, um, and so we needed to be able to go back, to figure out how to go back to that kind of, um, of a way of being. And so it's important. So in our, in our dictionary, for example, it was a little wet, um, the little wet dialect, but we added, we added all the other dialects in the dictionary. And so that people can learn those and know that there's a different way of saying it, you know, in the different in the different regions, and so we have that capacity. So know that wherever you're from, that this is the way that it the way that it's pronounced, the way that it's said, but in in these communities, this is the other way. In these communities, this is the other way. And so, and, and it's because we are human and we have the human capacity to be flexible and to be, um, and to be open, um, we can, we're able to, we're, we are able to do this. And, uh, and so it, that, that's what needs to be kind of naturalized and normalized. And one of the things that happened has happened is that you know uh, because of the of uh, what we learned from um, English or from other languages like from uh, other colonial languages they think that there's one way and 
and um, and that's what became imposed on us. We we need to be able to to understand that that as humans we're we're capable of diversity and flexibility. True. Okay, Taylor Salzbach asks, what do you see as the biggest hurdle within language communities and between different language communities towards revitalization? I'd say that one of the, the biggest hurdles that we have is the idea that um, that we that we can be proficient in many languages. The belief that we're able that that you know that we're able to be proficient in different kinds of languages, and um, um, and I would say that. One of the biggest challenges that we face is um, is to understand that we that the indigenous world is different from the colonizing world, and one of the things that we have to learn is the the is the difference that the English world, the French world, the Spanish world. The Portuguese world, the Dutch world, is different from the from the Lilwet world, from the indigenous world, and um, and we need to be able to be comfortable in border crossing, and um, and that and that you can and that you don't have to lose when you cross borders, and the, so the stronger that you are the stronger that you are in your personal sense of self, the easier it is to border cross. And um, the other is the, you know, that everything right now is, um, is designed, is designed to force a colonial language in daily use. So, so making the habit of using your own language on a daily basis is the biggest challenge we have because the media, the digital world is forcing another language on us and it's making it, um, and it's making it normalized and, um, and so finding the place finding the time and finding the mindset to use your lang own language is, is our biggest challenge right now. True. Thank you, Lorna. Your next question uh, comes from Pius Akumbu. Thank you for this great talk. Did you have to deal with people who were against your language revitalization activities? If so, how did you deal with such people? Yes, um, at many at every level, pious we had we had people who were against it. So, um, just to give you an example, um, when I was uh, I was publishing um, some history textbooks for public school, and I wanted to name the book uh, Shima and to spell it in my language. And, um, and that was a year long fight with a publisher, with the educators, with the editors. And, um, but it's something that, um, that we had to work out. We had to find common ground. We had to find a way of of understanding each other, and um, and so I think that that's probably the biggest lesson, is that you know when when we when we we believe that we have that we want to put our language forward, our ways forward, that we have to work on it, 
to find common ground and to find a, a way of um, communicating so that people can can meet the can meet the understanding. <clears throat> what I've also seen is um, opposition in our own communities, because sometimes people have you know said what they believe is that oh they say you know I want my child my children to learn English, they don't need my language, and uh, because you know who speaks our language. And so, again, you know, it's um, it, the best way to deal with it is through communication, not to argue, but to to understand where people have are coming from, how they've reached those conclusions, and um, um, the and also, you know, for each of us, and this is something that I've had to learn, is. Um, in, is to how to how to um, to explain things, to find ways to find the language to be able to explain the, you know different ways and different uh, thought thoughts about the subject and um, and to be respectful and honor and to honor where people are, but to you know but to to stand clearly and firmly about the the importance of our of our languages and the teaching of our languages and the the revitalization of our languages and why so it's really coming up with why why is it important why is our language important and when you connect our language, because our languages are the voices of the land and the connection to our ancestors and the ancestors of our land, people realize that, that then how important they are. Mm -hmm. Finding out how to talk to one another. True. Do you want one more question? One more, last one. Okay. And then let's have some music. Okay. This, is, this comes from Mariona Miret. I would say European minority languages have a lot to learn from indigenous language communities. Do you think the other way around is true? In what way, if so? I'm not sure, uh, absolutely sure what, um, what this is, but you know, the, those languages, um in europe are also indigenous to those lands and um and um and i think that they too are needing to be revitalized in the way that indeed you know that we are working on our languages and one of the things for example um i'll tell you this little story about um how I came to understand this. I was um, invited, this was in the, the mid eighties. <coughs> I was invited to speak to um, second language families in Vancouver, BC. So it's a large urban school district. And so I went to the school and there were, there was um, a large group of people and each, little group had an interpreter. So I was speaking and they and the interpreter would translate what I was saying into their into all these different languages. And I was talking about the about you know the diversity of languages in British Columbia. We have you know 36 languages and many dialects. And so I was trying to get them to understand this to to appreciate the diversity of our languages. And, um, and all of a sudden, the whole group started talking. It just seemed all at once. Nobody was listening to me anymore. They were all talking. And so I, I, you know, I um, stood back and I let them go because I realized that I had touched something, a nerve. 
And when things kind of calmed down, I asked what what was happening and the interpreters, um, there was a large um, group from Italy in the in the this in this uh, meeting. And that interpreter was talking about how they started talking about all of the the languages, the dialects and the different um, languages that were in Italy, but Italian had adopted one language as its language of the country. And the same thing that hap what was happening to our languages had was happening to their languages. And they were so excited and to realize what it, you know, to just to have an understanding of what had happened. And so I don't think that that was, that's unique to Italy. I think that that's happened in England. I think that's happened in, in um, Belgium. That's happened, you know, in every country, there are languages there that, um, you know, that have become devalued in the, the adoption of official languages. And, um, and, uh, and so the challenges that we face as indigenous languages are faced by those languages too. So we can all share and learn from each other. Thank you. Dr. Lorna Williams, thank you so very much uh, from all of us. Uh, we are all going to take in what you have um, been been sharing with us today and leave here with good feelings in our hearts and uh, uh, skip in our step, ready to dance in our next session here. Um, we really want to thank you, uh, Lorna. I'll pass it over to you. To say true, to say cook stems. Who we mash, um, cook stup, cat lap, slack a lap, uh, it's, um, in my language, we say stuhum, as we, when we go on a journey, wherever that journey might be, whether it's in the mind, the heart, or on the land, we say stuhum to let the to let the spirit world help you, to guide you on your path. So I say shtuchum to each of you. <laughs>